everybody's got a story. You just have to listen. Hola, I'm Joe Partavilla, and this is Good Listen. And today, Stacey Lynn Harris tells her story. You know, I dig doing this because I love chatting with folks who are completely different from me. Stacey Lynn is a cookbook author, a Southern lifestyle guru. She's homeschooled seven kids, and she's married to a dentist. I've done none of that, and I love it. All right, joining me on the podcast is Stacey Lynn Harris. Stacey Lynn, welcome. I am so excited to be here. This is going to be so much fun. I hope so. I mean, that's a lot of pressure on me at the jump here, Stacey Lynn, but I appreciate the enthusiasm. Uh, so full disclosure, I'm a lifelong New Yorker. You might have gotten from my vibe, uh, but I relocated to Charleston, South Carolina four years ago. And although I will, I want to preface. So four years ago was the pandemic. I moved down the, before the pandemic. So I was doing it before it was cool, Stacey Lynn. Yeah, um, there you go. But one of the things that I noticed when I came down here is, especially in Charleston, I'm not sure if it's like that in Bama, but in Charleston, no one's actually from here. Like they came here for school and stayed or they came or they came for a man or woman and stayed. So what is it about the South that sucks people in and they can never leave? I don't know. You know, I really believe, though, it's the um, it's kind of inborn in everyone to be hospitable and kind and to whether they put others before themselves really maybe not but they at least act like it and so right. i think people enjoy that although i will say i have visited uh new york on several occasions and sometimes i feel like the new yorkers are a little bit more friendly than they are here so it kind of go it, it sort of depends on where you are like are you in a rural area in the middle of the city you know or whatever um it kind of depends but um, I think it has to do with the hospitality and, and, and people bringing food. I think the food is big because South Carolina, the food is amazing. You're right there next to the coast. I mean, it's like, it's just great. And yeah, yeah. how can you get any better? Yeah. Yeah. And as I will say about New Yorkers being nice, uh, just so you know, we kind of overcompensate because we do have this sort of yeah. cliche view of, well, they're all dicks up there. And then, so <laughs> now, you know, when when anyone go, like out of towners go up there, I mean, you're going to ra randomly run into a grouchy New Yorker, but I think we all try to be better at, at welcoming yeah. all the tourists that come into town. Um, yeah. So Stacey yeah. Lynn, you, you have a, a very, um, I want to say odd background because I don't know, I've, I've spoken to a lot of people that have written cookbooks. Uh, some of the biggest and best that you could think of. You're the only one who's written a cookbook that also passed the bar exam. How, uh, how yes. did that happen? Well, I grew up in like a career oriented home and, and pretty much tried to like, um, be the best at everything that I tried to do. And, and, you know, my mom wanted me to be a business major, graduate. And I said, well, I think I'm just going to go and, you know, go to law school. And, and I had, and in ninth grade really is kind of an interesting thing. They picked several people to go and see a court case. Um, and it was at the military base, which was kind of unusual. Well, anyway, at that point I decided I wanted to be a lawyer and you know, I, I had planned that my entire life and I went to law school, passed the bar exam. Then my husband passed his test to go to dental school. So we moved within that year and I already had a baby. I had a baby the last year I was in um, law school, which was insane. But anyway, passed the bar exam and I practiced a little bit, but once I had my second baby, I was like, you know what? And I was so totally in love with my child and I did not like leaving him. And, uh, and then I had another one and I'm like, you know, it, 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 it's more affordable really for me just to stay here and to do what I'm doing. And as we started living at home together and I was looking for activities for us to do, we would start gardening. Uh, we went hiking and, and enjoying the outdoors. My husband was a big hunter and it just, just happened that one day, you know, we had talked about writing a book forever. So um, I wrote my very first book and it was on wild game of all things. And um, because I was like, I need pictures. I'm a very visual person. I like beauty. I want to see pictures. So I was like, I'm going to write a wild game book that, that I show pictures with every recipe. So then that just spurred on to other things, sustainable living. And then, um, and then, you know, I'm really... I'm ingrained so much in this Southern lifestyle that I'm like, it only made sense for me to write a Southern cookbook that has 
all of those elements in it. So that is how this book was born. And that's how I got to where I'm at. And I still love the law. One of my sons just ran for um, U.S. Senate. I mean, U.S. Congress. And I mean, I'm still involved in all that. We have seven children. I don't know if you know that or not. But right, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I just fell in love with one baby and we just kept having more. So yeah, it, it, was, sounds, it sounds like you enjoyed the process of that. Uh, uh, one of the things that, that also you talk about is homeschooling. You've homeschooled uh, all of your children. And yeah. here's the thing. So I don't have kids. And I always felt people that homeschooled did it for, for multiple reasons. But one of the things I always thought was a negative was you take them out of the element of like the shit we all need to, we put up with when we go to school, the bullies, the jerks, <laughs> uh, you know, having people talk behind their back, all the, you know, uh, yeah. teachers of, of varying qualities. And, and, and sometimes I feel like that helps grow people, like being able to, to, to experience hardships early, in, in their early ages. Why do you think it was important for you to do that, especially for the amount of kids? It, like if you had a couple of kids, you'd be like, oh, it's easy, but seven. That's a lot, yeah. Stacey Lynn. So, so why was it so important to homeschool? Well, for me, I, I felt like, well, there's so many reasons that it's crazy. <laughs> but, but for me, I felt like you're given, this is me and not the whole rest of the world or whoever. I'm not, you know, I'm good with school too. Um, but, and I think there's, like you're saying, there's drawbacks to homeschooling and there's drawbacks to going to school. But for me, I wanted the best hours of the day to be with my children. And for me, the best hours of the day are, you know, from 7.30 in the morning until, yeah, or, or, or really 10 to 3. Those are my best hours. I wanted to give my best to my children. I wanted to see them at their best. And I felt like I could train and teach them better if they were uh, with me, you know, during the day um, and 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 I would have better conversations with them, they would be better equipped for life. And I know I can see what you're saying as far as um, dealing with bullies, dealing with all of the things that we have to deal with in life. But when children are children, I don't think they're as equipped as when they're adults and I didn't shield them from the world. So I think that they, they, they did get that. They did know about that. They did see that, but it didn't necessarily happen to them when they're not equipped for it. I think both methods would work. I mean, you know, you're going to learn it one way or another, yeah. uh, but they seem to, but, but they seem to have really done good. You know, there are advantages and disadvantages to both. But to me, you know, being with my children was, was super important to me. So. And how how good was it that you had seven? Because I can imagine by the seventh one, you must have been like a kick ass home instructor or, or whatever, whatever, you know, whatever function you were doing it at home. But like you must have gotten really good at it. There, I wouldn't say that necessarily, but um, there were, there because all kids are so different. That was the other thing. As I homeschooled, I was realizing, oh, well, that curriculum is not going to work for this child. And I was able to shift and manage, you know, what this one was doing. This one could take a break in this subject because, you know, obviously they're blocked with it. Let's go and, and do like a, a unit study on, you know, some president or whatever and and do writing and, 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 and you could still do math and science with that because of the things going on around that time with that particular president. So anyway, it is really creative. It's really fun. And I'll say I homeschool this last one, which I'm still homeschooling one, um, quite different than I did the, the beginning ones. Not because I think I did something wrong necessarily. It's just things have changed. Life has changed. And then the kids, like as they've, when I had older kids and younger kids, the activities changed everything changed. And with every new addition, you know, things were totally different. So, um, and, and they have different things that they like mine now that I'm homeschooling, she's all into music. So, and I only have one other one that's into music. So that's, it's, it's kind of, it's really interesting to see the different personalities of these human beings that, you know, that came out of the same two people. It, it's, it's amazing. That, that is so cool. All right, thanks for indulging me on this. I have one more thing about this because you you mentioned that your 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 kids are doing very well, but I, I'm curious about, and maybe, I don't know if you could speak to this, but that transition from homeschool to then maybe going yeah. to university or, or, or higher education. Transition. What was I, that like for them? It was, uh, it. I will say that it was probably a bigger, uh, not probably, it was a much larger transition than from somebody going from traditional high school to college. So it took them, but it took them one semester. 
I mean, they were able to get in there. Uh, and, you know, my oldest son's a dentist and he, it, when he first went, it, I, I, I remember him telling one of my other kids, yeah, I made a D on my first test. And it was in that, you know, was shocking. But a lot of them, you know, they, they had to get accustomed to it. But after that first semester, they were good to go. And their relationships have been great. Friendships have been great. I mean, everything has kind of fallen into place. But every time I have a new one go, I'm like, Oh gosh, I hope this works. So, um, you know, there was a really big experiment. Um, oh, that, that, but, you know, yeah. That's so cool. That's so great. Um, and all right, last, last thing on this. So uh, I mentioned the pandemic before and obviously during the pandemic, a lot of people were forced to homeschool. Were yeah. you sort of at home kicking back like, I got this on lock. Every, every, you know, all these mothers and fathers are like pulling their hair, trying to figure out how to do this. Um, how were you able to maybe like help the, the the people in your community that had to deal with this for the first time? Because but you, you're obviously a pro at it, but for most, it's not easy, especially when you're doing it in such no. a turbulent time. So, so what was it like seeing it from your perspective? I wanted to help people as much as I could through this process. So I was getting calls and I was getting texts and different things from people around me. And my thought on that, now the, the difference between homeschooling and traditional education, everybody has to be on the same page in traditional education. So they had to get their kids ready for starting back school when it did start. So there was more pressure on them than I had because I knew that I was in it for the long haul and they did not, they don't necessarily have to keep up with the, the school or we could do a different thing than the school. Um, we could go ahead, we could go behind. I mean, you know, just kind of at our own pace. So that part was kind of hard for me to help other people with, but because I don't really feel like school um, needs to look like traditional education. The reason that it looks like that with everybody sitting down for, you know, an hour listening to a lecture is because that's the only way that you can do you can teach a, a number of students, 30 to 40 kids. You have to have it that way. And that's not necessarily the way we do it. I, I have my kids do a whole lot of research and different things. So that was kind of my um, advice to them is if they're having to write research, if they're having to learn about a particular thing, you know, uh, have them learn things about, about that subject that touches their soul. Like for me, it would have been fashion or something like that um, in 1809. What what did that look like? And then that would relate back to everything else. You know, the house, the farm. How did it look? You know, how did how, how did this happen? But it would have start with what clothes did they wear? So I was like, find something that they really wanted to look at, and then you know back out from that and and try to figure out a way to make it interesting to them. And it made it a little bit easier for people, I think, to homeschool when they thought, okay, you know, this is going to be fun for the kids. So making it fun, you know, is a real big part of it. Sweet. Well, thank you very much for humoring me. I, I'm sure you probably didn't expect talking about homeschooling for about 10 minutes. Didn't, but it was great fun. Yeah. yeah, I appreciate I appreciate that. All right. So uh, on the subject of your cookbook, because that's, you know, that's that that's what you're out there talking about now. The name of it is Love Language of the South, a celebration of food, hospitality and the stories of my southern home. And I want to kind of dial back to your first one when you talked about wild game. Um. If you go to a bookstore, people still do, if anyone's listening to this, they, people still do go to a bookstore. There are thousands of cookbooks, and then there are like hundreds and maybe thousands of Southern cookbooks. What was your, you know, when you talk to entrepreneurs, what, what, you know, what was your differentiator? What, what, do you feel, what do you think you were bringing to the table that was different that would cut through the clutter of all of these books, especially that first one? Because now you're probably like, I'm Stacey Lynn Harris, I got this unlocked. But like when you first started doing it, was it like, oh, like, and I don't like to use the phrase imposter syndrome because they say it's bullshit, but like, did you feel like fear or, or like, were you worried that, what, will anyone want to read what I have to say about cooking? Well, the first cookbook, I was so like uh, such a newbie that I didn't know anything. And so I had no fear whatsoever because I, I didn't know how competitive it was. And I, I what I did, this is kind of crazy. I was like, okay, how many hunters are in the world. I research how many hunters and I'm thinking, well, if I get 1% of those people to buy my book, I've got it made. And so that's all I went with. I didn't, I didn't look <laughs> at my competition. I didn't, I did not figure out what I should name it. I, I, did, I just did it. And, uh, and, and I didn't have a website. I, y'all, you would not believe this. This is terrible. I didn't even know. I, I don't even think I had an email address of my own. 
<laughs> I, we, I, I didn't need one. I, I just, ha- I did not know. So I learned from scratch how to do this and it was a real process, but you know, and I, but I knew enough. I ran for a lot of like student government and, you know, and, and president of this and that. So I, I, I kind of know how to market me. So, you know, I've been doing it since ninth grade. So I was like, okay, this will, you know, all I gotta do is call these people up and say, hey, you know, can I write this for your magazine? And so I did that with all of, you know, the, the outdoors magazines and stuff. And then one guy took note of it and there, his name was um, Alan Clements. He took note of it and wrote a newspaper article on Christmas morning about my book. And it put me on the map and a big, a bigger publisher, you know, came to me and asked me to write a sustainable living cookbook. And then they did a DVD and it just kind of blossomed from there. And now with this love language of the South, I differentiate my Southern book and there are a lot out there and the competition is huge. Um, Although I believe that if you like Southern cookbooks, that you're not just going to buy one. So I don't know that the competition is a problem because if you have a good enough book, then why not buy, you know, I know it's going to be bought by people who buy Southern cookbooks or, you know, really any cookbook. But anyway, with my Southern cookbook, it's different in the sense that I try to help people get food on the table or, um, you know, at a family reunion in the yard, uh, whatever the case may be, um, to be hospitable, meaning to care about other people. And it's not about making it perfect in my, in my book, using so many ingredients. It's not about anything over the top. It's about the people. And that's, you know, although, I mean, of course it's about great recipes and all of these recipes are tried and true. They are, you know, from most of them from my grandmother's kitchen. So they're old Southern recipes. I've got like, cakes galore, lane cake, hummingbird cake. Um, you know, I don't even know if people have heard of that. Um, and lane cakes and Alabama cake. Um, I've got coconut cake, pies, you know, you name it. If it is Southern, it's probably in the book in, in my favorite recipes. But it's truly grounded in the memories you're making with people, the people involved in it, and, and truly food is a memory maker. So whatever you're doing, you know, I, I, I have that recurring theme through the book, make memories, make food attach to situations so that those memories will be like branded in people's minds. And they'll think of you, they'll think of each other, they'll think of good times, leave your baggage at the door is one of the things that I say, and come in and let's relax together and, and, and have a conversation. And so I think that's what makes it a little bit different. That's awesome. I love that. Um, you know, it's funny. You were talking about food that brings back memories. I was just thinking this, and I'm not sure why. But uh, years and years ago, I was with uh, my sister's family. We were in like a ski house in Pennsylvania. And my brother-in-law decided to make stuffed mushrooms. And, I, you know, stuffed mushrooms are basically like a wad of bread stuffed into a mushroom. <laughs> so I'm sure there's all different kinds of it. Um, so I ate like five or six of them. And Stacey Lynn, it's one of the few moments I could count on my hand where I was almost deathly ill from eating a food. So oh, to this day, that, it's that like tw- was there. Yeah, yeah. So 20 years later, I still like stuff mushrooms. No, no, no. Thank you very much. Um, so is there a food because you as a as someone who writes cookbooks, I'm sure it's a lot of experimenting going back to talking about mm-hmm. your like your research brain. Um, are, are, were there times where you were coming together with all these recipes, whether they're, you know, not the classical ones, but when you're trying to reinvent something where you're like, oh my God, I, you know, I could have poisoned myself with what I was doing there because I can imagine the trial and error involved. There's a lot of trial and error, especially with the wild game. And no, I didn't think about that, but um, because, you know, I, I pretty much know things that can be rare, things that aren't, make sure that it isn't old, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but the trial and error, I'll tell you, I, we probably, I had my kids, this was interesting. I had my kids make all the recipes. I would write them. I would, you know, test them. I would figure out what I liked and what I didn't like. I would then have them make the recipe to make sure that they could do the recipe, like that my 14 year old could read and do the recipe. And so then I knew it was a good recipe if it turned out. 
because I know that, you know, they're, they're, that everything's in it, that everything's going good, that I gave good instructions. Um, but the pound cake recipe, I was looking for a particular pound cake. And then this is my memory attached to this pound cake where a lady came over. This is when I had three young children and we had moved into our house. We were new to the neighborhood. She brought a pound cake to the door in a, um, in a, a bread pan. And so it's shaped in the form of a bread pan, not your, you know, regular, um, is, is another dish that you would use for pound cakes a lot of time. And I wanted to make that particular one. I could not find this lady for the life of me. I looked up and down that neighborhood for where this lady lived. I wanted to give her a thank you note. I wanted to give the recipe. I couldn't find her. I'm like, is this an angel or something showing up at my door? Anyway, I never found her. So I was determined to find that recipe. And I think I got pretty close to the one in the book. But I think I tested using sour cream, using buttermilk. I do you know leaving this out using cake flour as opposed to regular flour i did everything i probably made that thing 40 40 to 45 times before coming up with it so there are recipes that are burned in my memory because of the process of me practicing trying to figure out how to make it the best i recently wow. and i didn't you know I, I don't want to keep rambling but i recently did my fried cornbread recipe like all weekend long because I couldn't find the, I, it just didn't taste like my grandmother's. So I called my dad and I said, you know, I was like, daddy, I, I cannot, I, it's not tasting like granny's It's good, but it, it's not tasting like hers. And she, he goes, well, they changed the packaging of, and, and they changed the formula when they changed the packaging of the flour, of the cornmeal. And now he said, you're going to have to use white lily as opposed to that. And, and, and it, it, it totally fixed it. So, wow. um, so it's stuff like that, it it's just trial and error. And then there's stories all about, you know, the, the trial and error. So, um, anyway, it's a lot of fun. That's so cool. Um, you know, it's funny you mentioned earlier and as part of your brand is sustainability. Now yes. for folks may say sustainability, man, Stacy Lynn Harris, she all woke. That's what that's what all the New Yorkers talk about. That's what the fancy people down in California think about sustainability. Yeah. Uh, first, first of all, how did it become a part of you and, and what you do? And then how do you explain to folks like, yeah, yeah, that's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. And, uh, you know, you can, you take in it, you use what's good, whether other people are doing it that, you know, you're not you know, on their same like team, so to speak. Um, you don't just not do it. If it's a good idea, it's a good idea. Um, so, it's, you know, to me, sustainable living is more self-sufficient living. And it's, you know, so we had gardens, like I was telling you before the, my children, you needed something to do, um, something to care for, something to tend for, you know, they had a, a pet. Now they have food that they're going to be able to bring to the table and feel like that they've accomplished something. So as they got older, um, each one of them had their own duties. You know, we did not necessarily make them do it because when people make, I think, their kids garden and all, they won't take that with them into the rest of their life. And we wanted this to be something that they would take to, you know, to the rest of their life that they would enjoy. And, and all of them do. All of them have some kind of little garden or they hunt or they do something for their own food sources. And it's um, it, it brings you a lot of satisfaction, confidence um, in, you know, a can do spirit, um, creativity, because sometimes things do not work in the garden and you're like, so how can I make this work? So adaptability, flexibility, you know, there's so many lessons to be learned, you know, in living off the land, so to speak. That's cool. Um, and I want to talk about the gender dynamics here because, uh, my good friends down here in, in Charleston, one's a good old boy from Virginia and other guys here from Charleston. They do all the cooking in their family. Like yeah, they, they yeah. do the cooking and the baking. They do everything. Um, and I try to think back to when I was a kid, I'm a Gen Xer, you know, growing up in the 80s. The idea of a man in the kitchen was like, what's going on with this person? What's what's happening there? It's like the man in the kitchen was like the single dad living his own after his wife kicked him out. Like that was that was the image of what a man in the kitchen looked like. But it's totally different. And I'm sure you see it on the ground level just because in terms of your fans, I'm sure, I mean, obviously you have women who support you, but I'm sure you have a lot of male fans. So talk to me about how gender dynamics have changed in the kitchen and how you're seeing it 
with with the people you associate with, connect with online and in person at events? Oh my goodness. I, you know, a lot of the people that I come in contact with are men because of the outdoor channel. So, you know, I, I, I have a show on there, um, the sporting chef and, and most of them are men and most of the people that cook while game are men. And I will have to say, I really kind of think that men like men teaching them, um, you know, how to cook, they'll listen to me and they'll, you know, they're kind of like, okay, you know, that's a pretty good idea. And, you know, but they want other men showing them how to cook. But, um, but my dad cooks, he, he's the one that cooks in, in the, you know, her, his household. Um, my husband cooks and his brother cooks is made the main cook. You know, my husband cooks probably, I won't say as much as I do, but when we're together, he does. I mean, he takes, he takes the responsibility. My, um, one, and, and a lot of times it's the meat. Cause I look at that, like last night, um, my son, my oldest son is married and, and she made everything that day. She made homemade bread and all this stuff, but she waited for him to do the trout. So he must've had some sort of plan, you know, that he was going to do for the trout. Um, and my other son, his wife is in the military and both of them are lawyers. She's in JAG and he wakes up and cooks her breakfast in the morning does all eat so i will say it has really i think flipped in that sense i think i know more men that actually cook than women it's wow. it's pretty it's pretty interesting yeah. yeah no it's cool like i said it's it's totally normal now but i'm just thinking back like yeah. 30 yeah. years it was just completely different and and i guess you bring a great point just the fact that a lot of your fans are in that hunting world and they see yeah. you so i'm sure uh what what are some of those interactions like stacy lynn out of curiosity because you're you're in this world of hunting which is like there's machismo to it and but here you come trying to teach these guys these macho guys <laughs> who are out there hunting how to cook um what's what, what's that connection like well you know maybe random encounters on the street like what what, what is what, what, what tell me about that how you how, you know tell me how you relate to the folks that that read your books watch your tv shows follow you online well, you know, uh, it, a lot of women really appreciate um, the fact that I'm doing the wild game or whatever, and they're interested in that. Or people will see me like, I, it, you know, it's, it's rare in my own town. A lot of times if I go out of town, I'll see people that, you know, know who I am a little bit, you know, or they look at me kind of funny and then they, you know, but I, I get that here sometimes at the grocery store and they'll be like, I, I've seen you before. I go, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't, uh, you know, I just kind of, you know, yeah, I have that kind of face, I guess. But then they'll go, oh, oh, I think I, I remember seeing you on, you know, on TV. Are you on TV? And, you know, we start talking and then then they really get into what I'm cooking and all that kind of stuff. But um, people are really supportive unless they're vegetarians. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'll get a little backlash with the vegetarians because um, of, the fact that we go hunt for our food, that we harvest our own food. The thing that pe in that situation, the things that people don't know is how much we are caring for the animals on our property. We're feeding them really good food. Um, you know, we're planting green fields for them. We're planting corn fields for them. Um, yes, it is to, to grow them, to to harvest, but it's also for their benefit. It's to keep them healthy. And we're also huge conservative, you know, conservative conservation. We're huge into that. Um, and the only way to do that is through control, you know, um, knowing how many you have, what's going on, what diseases are out there. And we're pretty much the first people to see that. And I didn't mean to go into that, but it, it kind of goes hand in hand. And so, you know, these conversations do come up with people. And, you know, it's, it's interesting what people will say over the internet that, that you might not, they might not say in real life, which I'm sure that you, you know, deal with that and encounter that, you know, from time yeah. to time. So. Yeah. And it's funny that you mentioned earlier that you didn't even have an email when you wrote your first book, which is kind of hysterical. <laughs> uh, but now Stacey Lynn, you're very popular online. Your social media channels have thousands and thousands of followers. Um, how does that help? Is it an a, is it almost like a distraction to your life nowadays? Because it's so it's really just the, it's it, it's like direct to consumer brands. It's like you are your own direct to consumer brand. You're doing using social media with it. Um, how do you play the, with that balance? Like you mentioned, you probably get folks that are that are you know um, you know vegan or, or vegetarian that may not like what what you do. Um, 
how do you parse out what you listen to, what you ignore? Because I can only imagine just because it's funny. I didn't even think about the the vegetarian or the uh, you know the the animal rights folks when we were discussing, yeah. and then as soon as you went there, I'm like, oh shit, I can only imagine what she's seen <laughs> on her feed. So so what has that been like? <laughs> Oh gosh. Well, when I first started, I, I, you know, and you would think going to law school and, you know, and all, you wouldn't be a very sensitive person. But when I first started this, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I mean, it was very upsetting. And I would like formulate a thought and go, yeah, I really shouldn't write that. Um, and you know, or it was, it was very awful. Now I just go through there and, and I don't, um, it doesn't, really bother me if it's really offensive i'll just hide the comment just because i don't want to get into a conversation about it um i'm not going to change their opinion i don't even know who has time to go in there and you know yell at me or whatever you know so to speak and so i'm not as bothered by it unless it's something you know uh, you know about my family which is very very rare i don't i don't i don't get that a whole lot um, so I've been able to kind of handle that part of it better. I do enjoy getting to know the people on my page, the people that are liking it, that, you know, get notifications when I go live. It's like I formed a relationship and I know it's not a like real relationship, but I have made some really great uh, friendships out of these people. I have a really good friend that lives in Texas and, you know, um, I, I feel like she's like my sister. It's, it's just really amazing. Wow the people that you do come across. And so um, I try to keep an open mind to that. But then I also know, you know, there's also stalkery types and, you know, people out there. So, um, but it's, it's been good. It's been good. I have a hard time keeping up with, okay, I need to post three to five times on Instagram and I need to do this and I need to do that. That part of it sucks the creativity out of my brain. And I am always trying to come up with a new solution to that dilemma. And if I come up with it, I'll tell you and, and we can have a conversation about that because I mean, people will probably want to know. And I have to right. it circles back to what you were talking about earlier with your kids when you have when you're forcing them to do something, it won't click. But here you are forcing yourself to like, oh God, I gotta do three stories today. I like and and that really just <laughs> takes away all the enjoyment. And it's so funny you talk about like negative comments. Um and I feel like these negative comments online screw it up for everybody else because I feel bad for like the fans that want to connect with you, yeah. instead of being able to just be like, oh, that's cool, you've got to go through the filth. Like, I, I remember one time when the Kardashians had blown up online and, like, Kim had posted some sort of random thing. And I was like, oh, let me just see what the comments are. And oh, she's no. got like, a gazillion. And I'm like, oh, my God. I'm like, how, how do they even know what their fans say? Because they've got to go through all. I mean, obviously, you're not at that. You don't have to deal with that well, to that yeah. extent. But just the well. idea of making it harder for like the true fans to connect and comment as opposed to then that the, then doing like what what you probably have to do is like i'm not even gonna bother reading it today or i'm not even gonna like engage yeah. which kind of sucks because it takes away the social aspect of, of of a social network you know yes yes it does but they cannot they could not create what they create if they're on that social media all the time. Although you have to post to keep up with, you know, the logarithm and all of that. Um, it's, it is a, it's just, it's disaster. They probably have just somebody running it and going in and checking it. And, you know, and I, you, I have I've had that before. I've had a, a social media person that would go in, they wouldn't necessarily comment, but they would come back to me during the day and say, Hey, somebody's asking about this. You know, what do you want me to say? You know, that kind of stuff. So if it's that important, they're probably, they probably are answering back, but for most of it, it's they're they're probably not, you know, interacting. Yeah. That, that would be my thought. Um, just because you can't create products and do big things if you don't put a halt on that to some degree, because it could take up all day, you know, just, yeah. it's just, it, it's unbelievable. Lastly, I want to ask about dentistry because you said your husband's a dentist, you got a kid that's a dentist, maybe another one of them come down the line, maybe a dentist and man, there's something about dentists that it's, <laughs> I, it's, I, I can't even imagine what it's like to live with one because it is, it, I think it's the one thing that we all do regularly that we all do. We don't mind doing, but we dread that the, the like the dentist yeah. is like our new mother-in-law or new or new parent where like they'll you walk in and you're like expecting them to like give you a lot of shit. 
So <laughs> what is that dynamic like at home? Because we all we all want the dentist, we all need the dentist, but we don't want to hear what the dentist has to say to us. So how, how does that affect you in your life? Not only having a partner, but also children involved in the industry. Okay, so um, my son still has the optimism, um, you know, because he's, I think this is his third year. Um, you know, practicing and, you know, with my husband and my husband's happy to have him because he takes over a lot of the hiring and, you know, firing and all of that. I used to do that. It was awful. Um, and you know, that part of it is really hard on Dennis. The biggest thing, and I, they have, you know, the number one suicide rate. I don't know if you know that or not. No. Yeah. And get this and, and lawyers are number two and preachers are number three. But, oh, um, and that might have changed since then. So I, you know, me being a lawyer and I think a lot of it's personality. Um, so we're pretty intense people. And so he's like a super intense person. He's an artist. All of these things just add up to, you know, uh, introspection. And then he's got people coming in, not wanting to see him. So I feel like for me that my job has been to be a cheerleader. So, you know, having to, so yes, it, it is different. It is different being married to a dentist and they all have a very peculiar, um, a great personality, but they're, but it's different. And my son will invite all of his friends from, um, dental school to go hunting. Like, so it'll be about, you know, seven or eight of them. And the jokes are so, they're just all different. It, it, it is, it is something to watch. Um, <laughs> you know, there's, <laughs> <laughs> just their, their their humor everything and my husband's super funny all these guys are super funny but it's it's just a different kind of humor it's very very entertaining that's yeah. funny are there any other possible harris family uh people going into dentistry or is that do you think that's the only one i've got uh one you know that's a lawyer or the next one that one just got her mba two of them are in engineering so no and okay. then when the other two I can't imagine. So I'm so, I, I'm like, I'm going to think no. So, so the, the, the faucet's been cut off to, to the dentistry pass from the Harris family, yeah. sounds like? I oh, think that's so. Funny. Well, this has been such a delightful conversation. Uh, we've went in all different places. I, I appreciate you humor me g going on these random tangents. Oh, Thank you so much work. for the time. Good luck with the book and uh, looking forward to see what you next. I'm not, I'm, to be honest with you, full disclosure, I, I don't even know where the outdoor channel is on my cable system. So I'm going to have to check it out, check out your show uh, and see if I can learn something because, you know, all everyone down here hunts for something. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, and you can use it for beef. Anything I do for venison, you can use. You can use beef. You just can't interchange. You can't use beef for venison because it's. Is that right? I don't know. The opposite. You just it, it it's different. It's just the techniques are different. But beef okay. will work with anything. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you again for the time, Stacey Lynn. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. It was great fun. Stacey Lynn's Love Language of the South is available wherever books are sold. And that's today's Good Listen. I'm Joe Partavilla. You can always connect with me on X, LinkedIn, or Instagram at Joe Partavilla or TikTok at Jay Partavilla. If you want to shoot me a note, you can always email me at Joe Partavilla at protonmail.com. And it would be awesome if you could leave a five star review on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube. Thanks for listening. Until next time, adios.